ministers of Houston together, ministers, rabbis, imams, and they came together uh, at our church. And uh, Bishop Fio, Archbishop Fiorenza and Rabbi Karf were among those who came. They were not asked to come, but they came. If you know anything about their, their diligence and, and, and their passion, then you would understand why they would come to a black church with a bunch of, of black preachers. Uh, but we were all concerned about uh, pub public defense. And when we came together, uh, the Harris County judge uh, came, to, came to hear what we had to say about a public defender. And when they saw all of us together, plus the archbishop and the rabbi, who was sitting on the front row, then they decided that they had better listen to us. They did, and Harris County subsequently uh, named a, a public defender, which, which was very important uh, to us and, 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 and to low-income people all over Harris County. And that public defender system, that public defense system, is still in place today? Still in place. So that's long-lasting, systemic change for good right there as a very early result of this friendship and this relationship between the three of you. Tell us, who are your heroes? Because as I sit here today representing Interfaith Ministries, I can honestly say you all are our heroes. Who are yours? Well, for me, uh, in our, interest is, our interest in trying to bring justice for all in our city, in our state, in our country, my hero would have to be Martin Luther King. Uh, he, had a, he had a very powerful influence on me as a young priest. And it was because of uh, his, his eloquence, the passion that he had to try to bring about justice for all, that I got really involved in it and decided to march with him. And I did, with him in, in Selma. So uh, I would have to say Martin Luther King is uh, uh, certainly my hero uh, among those still living. Now, some of those saints that went before me are also my heroes, too. Rabbi Carf. Well, certainly one of my heroes is Abraham Joshua Heschel who was a traditional rabbi. I'm a reform rabbi, but I was inspired by his great concern for social justice. Uh, too often, the tendency of those who are very traditional or orthodox in their practice um, did not go along with their reaching out to the larger community. But he paved the way, and he in turn influenced me to realize that while I have my own story and my own identity, particular identity, my own way <clears throat> of relating to God, uh, there is, I am also part of the larger story that unites all of us as children of God, and that I needed to go beyond the confines of my own group and identify with soulful leaders of other religious denominations. And that taught me and made me decide as a young rabbi, very young rabbi, that that was going to be a very important part of my rabbinate, of, of my ministry, uh, that it was not enough to focus only on the specific issues of my own community, but I needed to relate to the issues that bind us together as children of God. That's very powerful. Before I answer the question, uh, Sukri, I have to say a word of thanks to Interfaith Ministries. First of all, because 
of, of its uh, long-lasting interest in justice uh, for all and its long-lasting uh, teaching of, of, of this community about how important it is that whatever our religion, whatever the, uh, the theology of, 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 our, of our religion, uh, we should come together and be concerned. It probably could only be interfaith ministries who could put on this, this kind of a town hall and, and put it on camera. So first I ha have to say thanks to Martin, K Martin Kaminsky and to Jody Bernstein and, and to the people in Interfaith Ministries who would do that. Now, having said that, let, let, let me deal with, with your question. You ask who our, 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 our personal heroes are. I would certainly echo the Archbishop uh, in saying that it, that it would be for me, Martin Luther King Jr. I came to Houston in December 1955. It's a long time ago. I was born in, in, in June uh, 1928. Martin was born in December uh, 1929. So he was born shortly after, after I was. And when I came to Houston, it was uh, September of 1955. That was the month of, of Rosa Parks and, 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 and the Montgomery boycott. Uh, what she did literally began the modern civil rights movement. And I came to town at that time. And uh, the civil rights movement began in 1955, and, uh, and, 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 I, and I was, uh, I, I was at, at, at a university, Texas Southern University. And during that year, uh, something called the, the sit-ins began to take place. And our first, our first sit-in in, in Houston was in, in December 1955 of that year. So, so I would have to go back uh, to, to, that, to that year, 1955, and, 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 and say that uh, the young pastor of Ebenezer Baptist Church in, in Montgomery, who became the first real leader of, of the civil rights movement, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., uh, became my hero shortly after that. Thank you, and thank you, all three of you, for your very impassioned answers. We have young people here with us today that look up to you, I think, in a lot of the ways like you look up to your heroes. And they have specific questions to you. And when I ask them, what, what interests you most about Reverend Lawson and Rabbi Karf and Archbishop Fiorenzo? What would you want to ask these gentlemen if you could? Hands down, they wanted to talk about your experience with the civil rights movement. Hi, I'm Lorraine and I'm an incoming freshman. It is very ordinary today to see people from different backgrounds, religions, and races sitting together on buses, having dinner, and watching movies. Did you think that you would see your work come into fruition like this? Or did you think that your work was just a stepping stone in a long and tiresome process for freedom and equality for all people? Well, I would say it's a stepping stone, but we haven't completed the walk yet. The journey's still going on, but uh, we've made significant progress in the last 20, 30 years or more, but there's still a lot of uh, social injustice, whether the question is, is it systemic? I think it is in some ways. But I, I know that, uh, and thank God, we have made s some progress. We've integrated many of the public places which were not totally segregated back in the 60s. 
So progress has been made, but we can't stop now. We have to keep going. We have much more to do to see that we have true justice and for all people in this country. And we live up to our ideals of our Constitution. My years in Chicago were a very important part of my total ministry. And I somehow was invited to join the Chicago Conference on Religion and Race. And that was the, the start of my recognition that much as I intended to devote my attention to promoting Judaism and Jewish loyalties uh, among the younger generation, I was, I needed to be equally concerned about reaching beyond the Jewish agenda or recognizing that an important part of my Jewish agenda involves social justice and that therefore I needed to be ready to devote a good portion of my energy and time to joining with persons of other faiths in a concerted effort to promote racial justice and more generally social justice in our society. And I think Chicago was, was the formative period in my ministry when I became um, very active in what was called or came to be called the Chicago Conference on Religion and Race. This teamsmanship is a great part of what happened with me. I started working with university students with sit-ins and marches. Uh, that was in the 50s and 60s. And at that time, we were dealing with a biracial community. And so the early sit-ins, marches, protests were black versus white. And so when you saw a march, what you saw was basically black people protesting against a, a white system. What I saw with the march after George Floyd's death was a multiracial uh, rainbow of people. And there, there seemed to have been no difference between the anger uh, of black people and the anger of, of many different cultures. So I think that what I saw before uh, with blacks protesting against white uh, was, was a totally different thing with a, black, with a multiracial outrage against uh, what the rabbi has, has called systemic. And I think that we are now facing a, a system that is going to have to be completely changed, not just uh, blacks against white, white police, uh, but people who are living uh, in, a, in, a, in a corrupt system uh, and people who need to see change in, in that corrupt system. So I think that it's different. I don't think that we've gotten there yet. Let me say how important I think that people getting together is uh, when the Archbishop Joseph Fiorenza and the Rabbi Samuel Karf get together with the preacher, Pastor William A. Lawson. We're just Joe, Sam, and Bill. And I think that that's going to be an important part of that change. Today, we have Joe, Sam, and Bill right here with us talking about the, the civil rights movement of the 60s and the, the change for racial and social justice going on today. And uh, your comments are very powerful. And I think we'll continue, we need to continue to broadcast your messaging 
to come together uh, as much as we possibly can. And in Interfaith Ministries, we are committed to our mission as well of staying on that cause with you and continuing to put forth this message that we need to come together in the name of social justice, for racial equality. We do have another question from a youth uh, from Levi, who's 19 years old and a college sophomore at a historical black university. When you marched for civil rights in the 1960s, what hurt the protesters more? The tear gas and the beatings or the oppression and injustice of the time? I often ask this to myself because despite the brutal tactics used by the police against peaceful protesters, people continued to peacefully protest. When I think about the civil rights movement, I always wondered, how do peaceful people endure the violence? That's a very good question, a very good comment. Uh, certainly, for anyone who takes the implications of a religious view of life and the sense that we are all children of God and that we show best our love for God by our love for God's children, beginning with the most needy among them. If that becomes part or a, a central part of who we are as preachers and teachers, then uh, it follows from that that when we see our black brothers denied the dignity that all children of God are entitled to, only because of the color of their skin, it is sinful to ignore it and sinful to go about your business as if this doesn't affect me directly that there is no greater sin than that. And fortunately, uh, I realized that at an early age and wouldn't be able to, to live ignoring it. I knew that my life had to change in the wake of that development, that to allow our black brothers and sisters to stand alone is the greatest sin. Fortunately, it wasn't a struggle for me to make it a, a focus, one of the foci of my life, important for me. But uh, it was a question of finding what is the best way I can be of help? And now fast forward <coughs> from the 60s to present day, to your point, we are marching together. We, there's much greater diversity now, uh, marching together for equal rights, marching together against police brutality. I know that uh, Reverend Lawson, Rabbi Karf, you all were at George Floyd's funeral and at the march as well. And Interfaith Ministries, we were there also at the march. Can you just tell us when you were at the funeral, what was going through your mind? Well, what was going through my mind was really a, a number of things, but as I recall, I was struck by the fact that it was such a diverse group that appeared joining together in behalf of the injustice targeting our black brothers and sisters. And it didn't seem 
unusual to me. It didn't seem something even noteworthy. It's, it is something that I, I couldn't imagine it being otherwise. And obviously, I'm old enough to remember the time when it was otherwise. And, and I know in terms of my own group, which was no stranger to anti-Semitism, even in America, that there was a time when I was preoccupied with, with that agenda uh, and didn't reach beyond it. It's, it was all consuming. I'm so grateful that, first of all, the, the situation of my people in America has improved <laughs> substantially, radically. Uh, and I am grateful that I now feel it would be sinful for me to be totally preoccupied with the needs and aspirations of my own community when actually uh, there's, these are kin. They are not only part of the human community, they are my friends. And I couldn't imagine just standing apart from the call when I was invited to participate in the Chicago Conference on Religion and Race, uh, I became one of its most active member and eventually a leader. Um, and I'm so grateful for that. I would, looking back at my life, I would be, I would feel it sh was shameful for me not to do it. And that's so powerful that you have modeled that for your ministry, over the course of your ministry. You all have modeled that over the course of your ministries. We do have a third question uh, that was submitted by Reverend Laura Mayo. I'm Reverend Laura Mayo. I'm the senior minister of Covenant Church, an ecumenical liberal Baptist congregation. I'm grateful to be here with you today. I'm wondering how you would compare the protests and advocacy of your younger years with what you see and feel happening now. How are things different? How are they similar? Do you have wisdom that you would like to pass along from your experiences? Are there things that you're learning from today's leadership that you would like to highlight? One of the things that I would like to say is that I cannot imagine interfaith ministries doing anything other than this because where I got it from really was not the black Baptist tradition. This is not the black Baptist tradition. And I have said that, that Dr. Martin Luther King was, was my personal hero. Well, anybody who knows anything about the, the background of Dr. Martin Luther King knows that he went to India. And while he was in, in, in India, he became uh, fairly close to a man named Mahatma Gandhi, who was a Hindu. And he learned from him peaceful protest. And he passed that on to us, peaceful, nonviolent protest. And I think that because uh, he instilled that in us and and all of our marches were peaceful. Uh, and there has been an effort to make these marches pe peaceful. Sometimes we have succeeded, sometimes we have failed. But I think the idea of peaceful but, but, very, but very directed uh, protest so that we didn't mind being beaten up uh, or even killed, we had to speak out for, for, for the truth, uh, whether that was Baptist policy or Catholic policy or any, or any, any other kind. So, uh, so our response uh, to violence and, uh, and to bitterness now is not much difference from, 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 from what we learned from this Hindu. 
Archbishop Fiorenza, do you want to comment on the question? Well, I think uh, the difference between the 50s and 60s and now, um, well, I think there is a, a much greater sensitivity among the general public now than there was back in the 50s and 60s when uh, we began to uh, identify ourselves with, with the marches, with the desire to uh, overcome segregation and all of its evil forms, uh, there was a, a feeling, I think, that, uh, that that's all right for a few people to do this, but you know, just really nice, good people didn't get involved in that. But now I think the attitude is much different. There's a greater sensitivity in the general republic that understands the, the, the justice of the protests that are going on today. That they're, they're protesting because what was wrong and evil is still existing. And it, 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 it shows itself in the way in which George Floyd was murdered. So we, knew, we know that we still have much more to do to make this a truly uh, equal and just society, but we're on our way, I think, we're on our way. And I think that uh, the young people are gonna help us. I I'm so glad about the young people. They understand better than uh, my generation that that was wrong and back there, and it would be wrong now, and they wanna do something to, to make sure that we live up to our, our ideals and what we profess to be as uh, people that show love and equality to all people, regardless of their race, their gender, or their religion. The young people are very fired up right now. Um, and it is exciting to see them willing to protest uh, and certainly peacefully protest because we've seen, I think the vast majority have been peaceful protests. Uh, we, I participated in one myself, the same one you all did here in Houston on June 2nd, the, uh, the peaceful protest with George Floyd's family. And it felt good to lend my own person to it. Like you said, Rabbi Karf, you know, it felt good to personally take that stand and raise a sign to say that black lives matter and we can't breathe, things of that nature. Um, and it was, it was also very encouraging to see such a large group of faith leaders there as well, because more than 200 faith leaders assembled at the Hilton America's Houston Hotel before for prayer. And then we all went out to march together. And we quickly got lost among each other in the crowd, but every once in a while we'd, we'd see a member of our group and, and wave and, and just keep marching. How can the faith community really come together at this moment to continue to help dismantle this, these anti-black sentiments uh, that are pervasive in America due to our racist culture. How can we come together as people of faith to better understand each other and help break down maybe fears or stereotypes about black people in this moment? Well, I think a a critical factor is for individuals who have leadership ability. There are leaders, you can, they emerge from, from the crowd. And I think it's very important as we move forward to elicit the support of individuals who are leaders wherever they are in a group. Some of them are already part of the cause, but more than a few are not. And I think it's these individuals who need to be enlisted because their influence 
is way above average on their peers. And I think in terms of speaking of the Jewish community, I'd like to see more of them identified and enlisted if they are not already part of the answer, the response to the problem rather than part of the problem. I would say that where we began with two white clergy on the front row is probably where we should be right now, which is what Sam just said. We need to enlist people who are not black, people who are not poor, but people who have some influence. I think that right now, while if I walked into an office uh, and said, I want to talk to, to the CEO, they, they might look at me and say, well, you're a black preacher. He doesn't want to talk to a black preacher. But if all three of us went in, I think they would say, open the door to these guys. And I think that, that just because we have the influence that we have right now, not as, not as a single person, but as three clergy who want to express, who, 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 have, who have been, been, been known to express our Judeo-Christian calling, our, our Judeo-Christian ministry. Uh, I think that just because they would know who we are, they would, they would give ear to us. And if we would reach out and touch other people of our faith, even just of, 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 of our philosophy, and if we would just enlist some of these people, not clergy, but business people and, 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 and political leaders, I think any number of people would listen to us if we, if, if, if we, if we just called them in, 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 into the business of trying to get policing uh, cleaned up in Houston. Uh, I think that if we, if we enlisted them as part of the team to clean up government, I think they would listen to us. I read in an article written about uh, the three of you and about your relationship and the way that you all have been friends and worked together for many decades, many, many decades for civil rights, that you have expressed the power in the relationship comes from all three of you standing together instead of just one of you going and, you know, fighting for the cause, but the power comes from the three of you standing arm in arm, fighting for the cause, fighting for change. And that you felt like because it was the three of you, your voices were amplified many times over instead of it just being one person. I'm sure that's true. That's certainly our feeling. And I, I might say that uh, we drew closer together as persons who cared deeply about each other, as persons, by coming together in behalf of a cause that we realized we shared. And so that I would regard one of the great blessings of my life is my friendship with Archbishop Fioranza and Reverend Lawson. There's no doubt that our friendship is deeply meaning to each one of us, but our influence is beyond the three of us individually, but it's what we represent. We represent uh, the, 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 uh, the branches of Christianity and Judaism. And 
our, our, each individual traditions come together as one religious voice to speak to the larger community about the problems that are existing among us today. So we, uh, we hope uh, <clears throat> that we will continue to be able to do this, but we're getting very old now. We'd like to see some younger people come forth. But as long as we have God gives us life and breath, uh, we're willing to come together uh, to address the problems in our community today. As we said, we've made great progress, but we still have a long ways to go. When we have such a killing that we witness in the, uh, about George Floyd and the fact that he was at the hands of some of our police officers uh, shows us we still have a long ways to go to make racial justice uh, 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 an American reality today. That's right. And I know before, before our interview started, you told me really faith work has no retirement. You just keep going. I do want to ask you all about uh, fear and the, the fact that black people do live in fear in this country of being racially targeted and brutalized. Uh, we have seen this play out in the media over and over again. We've been talking about George Floyd, um, you know, James Byrd from 20 years ago, Trayvon Martin, Rashad Brooks from just a few days ago, and just so, so many more. Systemic racism and oppression and the gratuitous and unrelenting police brutality uh, that we have seen in the media and on social media uh, has, have in some ways dehumanized black people, especially black men. And I did hear you say we're all equal in God's eyes. We're all, as children of God, we're all equal. Do people of faith even struggle to recognize black humanity sometimes? In my opinion, if they were struggling with that, then they don't understand their faith very much. As my rabbi spoke eloquently to what uh, God's love for each one of us, regardless of our ethnicity or our background, we're all God's children. And uh, we're all, in, in, in the eyes of God, his beloved children. And so for anyone struggling to understand why black people are fearful, I think they don't understand what, our, what their faith really means. But there are people who still need to be reminded in a, as compelling a way as, as possible that they cannot be faithful to their own religious tradition at its best without having respect and love for those outside your family and your tradition and the persons you interact with on a daily basis. That's, that's a concept that may be verbalized, but it's still not internalized as powerfully as it needs to be. When it becomes powerfully internalized in the mass of Americans, we will go a long way toward advancing the dignity of every human being, regardless of their religious tradition. Sukri, you will understand this more than any of us here will understand. We still have not gotten to the place where all blacks will be uh, humane to all blacks. Uh, we often have the difficulty of being able to accept all of our own brothers and sisters as brothers and sisters. So I think that part of what needs to be done is not simply 
to convince whites to accept us as human, but to accept blacks, uh, but, but, but to get blacks to accept all of us as human. Those of us who are bourgeois versus those of us who are low income uh, will often build walls uh, against each other. So we've got some work to do within, uh, within uh, our, our, our own communities. And hopefully we will do that where, 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 where we can come together as a people, recognizing those who are not middle income or upper income, but those who are lower income. My hope is that through this process of the world really coming together right now uh, to stand in solidarity with black people right now, it's, it's pretty incredible to, to witness it and watch it, um, that we will make positive change in that respect as well, that black people are seen as human beings and not, you know, that, that we're just not going to continue to be subjected to such violence and brutality, and no one says anything, including ourselves. You know, we all, you're right, we all have such a responsibility to speak up and to stand up in this time. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a time, I think, where some people sense a timid yet palpable sense of hope that going forward from this moment as we go forward into the future, we may finally be at a pivot point in the United States, right? Where we can begin to overcome the issues of racism and inequalities and police brutality the things that black people are facing every single day. And not only black people, but there are, you know, people are being subjected to racism. Uh, so we have opportunities here to come together and to continue to progress forward in this work. I just, I'm, I just, I have to ask you, I have to know from, from you all, how do you feel people of faith can help make this a lasting change. We're at a strong pivot point right now, but how can people of faith really step out right now and just help us make this a change for good? Well, I think they, if they can be true to their religious beliefs, they will do this. And uh, not to do it, is to betray what we profess we believe. I think that some of those uh, signs I saw all, during all the protests, that silence is a... Uh, is, uh, violence. Vi yeah. Silence is violence. Yeah. Silence is violence. And I think the for the religious community to remain s silence at this pivotal moment is a, vi is a violation of their belief. I think it's a wonderful moment, as you just said, for the religious community to take this and really move it forward to the way in which we truly believe that God wants us to do it. And, and, I, and I think we, if, if religious people are, are true to their own beliefs, then this pivotal moment will truly be a moment of great, great progress. It would, it's, very, it's a very powerful thought and a very powerful sentiment. Uh, you all have certainly put your lives on the line for it, if you will, in many ways. You, you, you know, stood at rallies and marches and you were on the front row when you needed to be on the front row. And I think that is, uh, you know, the moment that many of us are coming to in our own lives. We need to make that decision for ourselves when it's time to stand on the front row with your brother and your sister, um, you know, black, white, or whatever, and just come together uh, for the, the good of the cause. Through your own actions, 
you've been an ally to the movement for civil rights and social justice for many, many decades. How would you advise the general public to be an ally for the cause of equal rights for black people and also people of color around the world even? I think it's gonna depend upon the religious community to, to uh, energize them to do this. Uh, just for an example, I saw in the, in the paper Sunday, uh, Bill O'Brien, the coach of the Houston Texans, coming out saying what it meant for people, for the football players, to take a knee. That That's something that he identifies with. He said something that he approves of to show that uh, that the, the football team, the players, are seeing, showing that we must do away with this inequality, with this forms of racism. And to have public figures like that come out and make these statements is going to help uh, strengthen what the religious community is trying to do. So I think more of these public figures coming out like Bill O'Brien did is going to help us push the ball down the field. That was a strong move by Coach O'Brien. Absolutely. And I know his players. I know that meant a lot to the players. I think a critical factor is the role of the various religious institutions in their educational programs to be sure that they have embodied in a powerful way the notion that we are teaching you to be faithful to our tradition. We hope that your children will be Jewish and so on and that you will raise them in the tradition. But I think as we promulgate that in our religious institutions and in our educational institutions, we need to address this question. Are we teaching our children not only to be respect who they are as Jews, and to be faithful to their tradition and to find their spiritual nourishment in their tradition. But are we educating them to respect and love and appreciate those who are not part of our tradition? Because that combination of love for our own kinsmen and respect for the dignity of all God's children has got to be embedded in the way our children think at an early age, at a, in adolescence, and yes, in adulthood. I think responsible religious leaders of all our traditions in America need to take seriously the question, am I teaching the next generation not only to love and to practice our tradition, but to recognize that a vital part of our tradition commands respect for the dignity of those of other traditions. In the New Testament, there is a story of a Pharisee who comes to Jesus and asks him, what are the two great commandments? And Jesus said, well, the first is that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. And the second is like unto it. You shall love your neighbor as as you love yourself. Those, he said, are the two great commandments. And I think that that teaches us some things as well. 
I think as faith leaders, we, we do need to get our younger leaders to become part of this team. We are two, oxy, two oxygenarians and one, and one nonagenarian, so we're not going to be around here for a long time. But it is important that we try to get into the team some of our, some of our younger clergy preaching and teaching about humaneness and trying to use their influence with the political leaders and commercial leaders of, of, of our community to do something about humaneness. Obviously something about loving God but also, about, but also about humaneness. If, if we can begin, and I'm saying peaceful protest, if, 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 we can be, if, if we can begin serious but peaceful protest, and if we can get our police right now seriously need to be, need, need to be reformed, and that's not going to happen because uh, we, we carry signs or because we uh, write articles or, or, or because we get on TV. It's going to happen when our leaders of, of different traditions and of different occupations uh, begin to do protests editorials, uh, things that, that, that say, just as we now say, you can't come into this place without wearing a mask. So we start to say, you can't be on, 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 on this police force uh, unless when we look at your record, it does not show many offenses. The man who held George Floyd down until he died, was a man who had 18 offenses on his record. And nobody ever looked at that. And so some, somehow we're going to have to protest against those, pal those, uh, those policies that, 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 de that dehumanize people, whether it's black or low income or alcoholic, there, there are any numbers of people who can be held down. And we need to, to protest peacefully against, uh, against dehumanizing those people. I've, amen. I've been taking notes on what you said on how to be an ally and getting our business leaders, our faith leaders, influential people in the community to stand up for the cause, to speak up, uh, getting people involved to peacefully protest, to take a knee, and then teaching our children at a young age, starting from the very youngest of ages, to love and respect and honor other people that are not the same religion or the same race. And embedding those thoughts very early on and living it so that our children can see parents modeling that same behavior. And then at the end of the day, and really at the start of every day, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Yes. It does feel like we are in a place in time right now in the United States where similar to Moses was when he was standing at the burning bush, he was called to action. And now it feels like we're being called to action for justice and for equality. That's true. 
Listen, thank you very much for leading us in all of this. Well, thank you for being here. And before we let you go, you know we, we would love if you could just lead us in a moment of prayer uh, while we're all together in this way and at this time. Well, let us pray. Oh, gracious and holy God, we come together as your children and know that you love each one of us in a very special way, no matter who we are, whatever our race, our ethnic origins, or our nationality, or our religion. We're all your precious children. Help us, gracious God, to know that we are doing your will when we show your love for all people. Help us, help us in our, in our everyday life to, to bring love and respect to all of your children, wherever they are. And in doing so, we know we are truly doing your will and we're bringing your love and your love into this world and helping us to live out our, in this world, to live out what you believe most dearly, that we are your children and deserve love and respect for each other. Amen. 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 Okay. All right. Amen. Well, let me just say, Archbishop Fiorenza, Rabbi Karf, Reverend Lawson, thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today here at Interfaith Ministries. As I said in our opening, uh, you are our heroes and we are eternally grateful for the work that you are doing uh, in this space of civil rights. And to all of you who have joined us today, we say thank you. And to our audience that will watch this broadcast at a later date, let us all go forward from this moment, uh, building on the reflections of our three amigos here and continuing to stand together in the fight for justice, equality, and respect. Thank you. <laughs>